such a pleasure to have you all come us with your song. It's such a privilege to be here as well as the Lindsay Guitar Group. Our next speaker, um, just to also provide, to welcome us to this beautiful space where we are today, um, is Vincent Kwan from the Dr. Sun Yat-sen Before I came in today, uh, a colleague of mine actually asked if, uh, if I'm going to make a long-winded memorandum <laughs> speech, but uh, I know as much as uh, all of you want to hear me talk, I'm not the uh, real purpose for you all to be here today. So, uh, But I still want to take the opportunity to welcome everyone uh, it's, uh, to this very lovely afternoon uh, to the Dr. Sun Sen, Sen Classical Chinese Garden. Um, I think for a lot of us who work and volunteer um, in the garden, we come across uh, comments from our visitors on a daily basis about how beautiful the garden is uh, in any season, uh, no matter how heavy the sun, the rain, or, or, or even the snow is. Um, but of course, uh, if the, I think the garden it can only be as beautiful as the amount of care and love that we, um, we put into it. And uh, the, the, it can only be as beautiful as the amount of um, uh, 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 efforts that we put into preserving and nurturing it. Yeah. And on many levels, I think that applies to, uh, to our communities. Any communities um, uh, uh, requires that we uh, invest the, the care in order to make uh, any communities livable and healthy and sustainable. Um, and the garden is definitely happy and honored to be uh, the venue of choice for this uh, very wonderful event today. Um, so we are definitely in, in support of initiatives that help to build a better and sustainable, um, healthy community. Uh, before I end, I'm sure uh, the team uh, is going to kill me if I don't say this. Uh, January 29th is going to be our Spring Festival uh, as uh, one of the uh, known annual events in Chinatown. Uh, as we always do in the garden, uh, for as part of the celebrations, we, we will have temple fair, uh, a very uh, fun activity driven uh, events, uh, open to everyone in, in the communities. Uh, so uh, please uh, take the uh, chance to visit the garden and be part of the celebrations on January 29th. And with that, uh, I'll pass it back to. Strategic Action Committee. And to give you a little information about who we are and what we're doing, um, we are a committee comprised of 30 members, who in which are residents or various stakeholders in the downtown east side. And uh, we came together over the past year to co-create a community economic development strategy, which was passed out of the city of Vancouver um, to be an extension of the downtown east side plan, the local area plan, and uh, be informed by the healthy city strategy. And Wes Regan is one of our liaison staff through the city um, and has been uh, part of the committee as well. Um, so in November 30th, we uh, went to uh, city council with our recommendations for a co-creation co community economic development plan and uh, were approved for funding. And so at this point now, we are beginning to implement our quick start projects and feasibility research. Um, but today is about our um, retail gentrification and social inclusion working group, working group um, that is part of the committee. And uh, all of the members here um, are part of that working group and uh, worked very hard to uh, do some research in the community about the community's retail needs and we'll be presenting that today. Um, 
Yeah, and uh, also I just wanted to let you know that I will um, be here at the front taking notes so that I can share uh, the outputs from this event with you all afterwards. Uh, but if you are interested in connecting with me or learning more about the Community Economic Development Strategy, um, you can sign up for our newsletter up at the front, or you can also uh, take one of my business cards there. Um, and a couple other things to note, uh, washrooms are out the back and to the left. Um, and uh, we also have Wilson Liang, who's a member of, of SeedSAF, doing Chinese translation over the headset. So headsets are at the front signing table if anybody needs one. Thank you for coming out tonight. So as Alicia gave it away, no, my name is Kiri Bird, and I've been a facilitator with the Community Economic Development Strategic Action Committee, so I'll be your host this evening. And um, just an overview of what we're going to do today, the goal is to hear back from some uh, groups that uh, both via this, the CED strategy and outside of it have um, conducted some really important community-based research into retail needs and priorities of the downtown east side, Chinatown. And uh, those will be five minute presentations. We'll hear from the three researchers and then we'll hear, back, we'll hear from Wes Regan from the city of Vancouver who will speak to some of the sort of directions the city is going and some of our partners are going to try to address um, the retail needs of the, of the neighborhood. We're going to um, then uh, bring everyone up to the front and do a panel discussion. I'm gonna hopefully get through two or three questions with all the panelists. Um, I'd like to give the audience a chance to sort of debrief at their small tables what they've heard and sort of digest and hopefully then we'll, we'll take a few questions from the audience before wrapping up. Um, it's a packed agenda so we're not going to um, break for food so if you need to go to the washroom or get yourself anything to nourish yourself please just do it at, uh, as you will. That's sort of the agenda for today. So with that I think I will call up our first presenter. So Kevin Hong from the is the executive director of the Hua Foundation, a nonprofit organization with the mission of supporting Chinese Canadian youth to participate in social and environmental change in their communities. Hua is a play on uh, words in Mandarin and symbolic of the foundation's work depending on which words are used it can mean culture, change and people of Chinese descent. So the data presented today is part of the Hua Foundation's Food Security Initiative, the Choi Project, and the full report uh, will be published in spring 2017. I'm sure Kevin will tell you more about that. Thanks, Kerry. Uh, thank you, everybody, for uh, coming on an evening on a hot day. Uh, so since I only have five minutes, I'll keep it quick and snappy. Uh, we're on social media. Please tweet us, uh, call, you know, tag us, uh, all platforms. Uh, yeah, please. So just a little context about why we conduct this study. So. Uh, Choi Project started in 2012, and we've worked with uh, one of our main partners, Chinatown Supermarket, which is on Kiefer between Maine and Gore. Uh, however, they, uh, their property was sold two summers ago. And this is not a unique case in terms of Chinatown, especially the food retail uh, scene. And we actually have lost uh, quite a few partners due to them closing down, moving away, and other types of losses. So a part of the, for us, it's trying to figure out what type of, uh, why they're uh, closing down, moving away, and we need to find out the trends. Uh, so a couple of bigger context questions, I think, for the group us here uh, to consider, especially for the discussion later, is uh, one, um, the parallel food system that exists in Vancouver. So over the almost 100 years now, there has been racist policies of, uh, against Chinese businesses, especially starting in the early 1900s against uh, Chinese farmers and food businesses. And that kind of uh, segregation formed a parallel food system that's become quite segregated and insular. Uh, and this is part of our work as an organization is trying to uh, engage uh, Chinese food businesses on sustainability and local food movements. So that's one. The other one is just recognizing the socioeconomic status of the neighborhood. And a lot of these businesses provide uh, affordable, accessible, um, and uh, local food for a lot of its residents. And, and for us, the culturally relevancy of the food that's being offered is also critically important. So just a couple of things to keep in mind as we discussed uh, today. Uh, so this is very preliminary data. Uh, originally, when we wanted to look into the losses over time, 
we want to look into business data licensing. However, licensing data doesn't give us the type of business. So we did a Google Street View, and Big Brother Google has uh, taken snapshots of our streets uh, every three years since 2009. Uh, and pulled from this data is uh, type of businesses. So as you can see, uh, it's quite significant the changes in terms of uh, the culture appropriate types of food businesses broken down into these categories. However, we just want to point out in the last row there, uh, the restaurants, bakeries, and cafes, actually there was an increase in the past six years. And that's due to new businesses coming in and new cafes coming in. However, our data did not go into the qualitative aspect. So one food asset does not equal another. So what is it that we can measure to make sure that it is affordable, accessible, as well as culturally appropriate? If new businesses are coming in, are they serving the current residents? Are they serving the new residents or other? Please. Uh, and the second part of our study, we actually looked into a lot of uh, plans by the city and policies to try and draw out potential collaboration opportunities with the city to try and maintain the affordability of these uh, retail food assets. So some of the ones that we looked at is the uh, downtown east side local area plans, uh, downtown east side uh, social impact uh, assessment, Vancouver food strategy, which is our primary document that we work off of, and the city of Vancouver's healthy city strategy. <coughs> and since we operate in Chinatown, uh, we also work with the Chinatown Neighborhood Plan and Economic Revitalization Strategy. So there's an update for that that's actually been uh, going around for community consultation, and the next consultation is happening February 14th. I encourage everybody to learn a little more about the plan. Feel free to chat with me or other folks in the room that might have uh, some ideas about uh, this plan. And for us, this is uh, one of the proposals for the new uh, plan. Uh, I actually took this from the city document and placed the remaining uh, food assets. So I lift this to the remaining green grocers, fishmongers, as well as uh, butchers, because they all provide uh, fresh produce and meat, uh, often sourced from local sources. And if you can see, it's concentrated towards the east and the south. So when rezoning does come in, um, what does that mean for these retail businesses that still continue to serve the community? And it's also important to note that down in the south, uh, Northeast Falls Creek Flats is also coming in. So what does that mean in terms of uh, property value and assessments? Uh, and just going back to Chan Chan Supermarket, it was actually resold uh, a few months after this first sale, and right now it's sitting empty, and part of our uh, network uh, was calling them now, uh, recently, and they're actually leasing uh, short term for $9,000 a month uh, for a person who wants to take that lease. So what does that mean in terms of, uh, yeah, food assets and the parallel food system and all the growers and importers and distributors that uh, sell to these end access points? So looking forward to chatting more. And yeah, and those are our details and our handles, so that's fine with us. <laughs> Thanks. making slides available um, after this event as well as summary of the themes that emerged in today's conversation. So we're going to do our best to get this information out beyond this room and into the neighborhood. Our next speaker is Pete Fry, formerly the chair of the Strathcona Residents Association. Pete sat on the Danton East Side local area plan and has been a very active organizer in the community on everything from heritage preservation to food security to traffic management if and when viaducts do come down. Uh, to current issues like increased port rail traffic and tomorrow's tomorrow's healthy communities forum. Pete currently works on place-based collective impact strategies with Our Place Ray Cam. I'm going to have to just take this uh, up the thing because it's too short. Um, so I didn't really prepare other than uh, I'm just going to try and wing it from my notes and from the slides. So first slide, please. Yeah. So. Um, Oh, it's really hard to see. So we, uh, we conducted a business and retail survey, and we employed local teams uh, from the Strathcona and Raycamp communities uh, to go out and do some of the legwork for us. Now, I don't have kids myself, but I did find that uh, I did have to do a lot of cleaning up after these kids, because a lot of the information uh, was a bit sloppy, but it, they had a good time, and they got a lot of stuff done. So we uh, interviewed and uh, surveyed 563 individual residents uh, questions like, where do you live? Uh, what kind of businesses do you want to see more or less of? How much shopping do you do in the area? And what does locally serving retail mean to you? 
And then they also went and cataloged local businesses. So they cataloged 378 local businesses, uh, including some in-depth interviews. And then I did some follow-up interviews with some of the businesses. They asked sort of details of the land use, local multipliers, how can they better serve the local community, and how can the city help them better serve the local community. So the kind of areas that we covered were, we left the sort of DEOD uh, Chinatown area largely alone, although we did do a little bit of overlap in Chinatown. Uh, but predominantly, we went down to Thornton Park, uh, down here in Kawasa East, the industrial zone, all around Strathcona, up into Railtown with a little bit of the DEOD and a little bit of Gastown. So they had some mapped out areas, and they had instructions because they were teens not to go anywhere that they didn't feel safe, that kind of thing. So the results of the business survey, I know the really busy slides, but yeah. I'm really glad because I didn't prepare anything, and I'm like, oh, I can use my slides. So we cataloged 378 businesses. We had 132 detailed responses and dozens of in-depth interviews. While our primary focus was Strathcona Thornton Park and the industrial area, we did do some overlap into Chinatown and the DEOD and Railtown. So we got a kind of good sense of the kind of businesses that we were finding, uh, mostly retail and service, uh, and a considerable amount of industrial. And then there's a lot of mixed use, and it's in the actual charts that are linked off this document. 90% uh, of the businesses identify themselves as local. Uh, half of the businesses that we identified have been in the area for more than 10 years. Most of the businesses that answered expressed a, a complex and conflicted relationship with gentrification, because that's one of the questions we asked them. Uh, they had a conflicted relationship with gentrification, and they did actually express a willingness uh, to work with the community to help bring positive changes for low-income and local residents. They just didn't know how. And I think this points to a great opportunity for SIDSAC moving forward to engage those local businesses and how they can work with uh, the existing community, with the low-income community, and better engage them. So some of the positives that the businesses told us, uh, why they're in the area, they like the larger, older spaces, they're cheaper and they're close to downtown. They like the history and the context and the industrial zoning in many cases. They like the sense of community. Uh, many of them, as I mentioned, expressed an interest and willingness to get more involved in the community, uh, social impact in helping the low income community. Uh, and a lot of them did like the gentrification and the condos that were coming. Of course, we had a lot of people who didn't like that. I would say probably more people didn't like the gentrification of condos. But the negatives included anxiety in the industrial let go areas, so specifically around Kawasa. Uh, there's uh, a lot of concern about some of the land assembly in the zoned industrial areas. So in the Kawasa district, a lot of that zone industrial is being let go to be redeveloped as condos and, uh, and, and rental and social housing, and uh, also in the DEOD. And there's a lot of concern about them losing those spaces. Uh, they feel that there's poor maintenance by the city. There's a lot of crime, nuisance, garbage, pests in various areas. Uh, they feel there's a need for more amenities, lighting, bike parking, garbage bins. Uh, they feel that there's been a lack of clarity and leadership with Downtown East Side Planning. Sorry, Downtown East Side Planning team, I know you're all here, I'm just reporting it. Uh, they feel uh, strongly, there's a very strong sense that Chinatown is being destroyed, and that came up in a lot of the results. Uh, there's also a lot of people who are very concerned about the gentrification of condos. Uh, people are concerned about poverty and homelessness, and a lot of the comments were to the effect, why aren't we doing something about it? Uh, not that they were concerned about it being there, they were just concerned that we're not doing enough to address it. Of course, I was concerned about drugs, and specifically the drug market. Um, there was concerns about parking and the lack thereof. Uh, and there was, uh, in the recent follow-ups, uh, we heard a lot of concerns about traffic management, and specifically the trains that have now started running on the Burrard Inlet Line. So that's a fairly recent development, and we haven't had an opportunity to do a full, thorough uh, revisit with all those people who were affected, but that's definitely top of mind now. Uh, next slide. Oh, okay. you guys need a little bit extra time. Look at that! Look at that! Okay, I can try my best to do this. Okay, so residential service. So we surveyed individual residents, 563 individual surveys. We did this by way of door to door, online, and in public places. Uh, most of the respondents identified as modest income, uh, and most identified as residents of Strathcona. Now, we did find that some people didn't necessarily identify under terms like. DEOD or McLean Housing, and we had some sloppy data entry for locations where they got really too specific. But in any event, uh, most of them were identifying as Strathconans, uh, and a significant number of these residents shop locally for groceries. What we heard that people want, they want more, and this was across the board, across income brackets. So what I've got here, uh, blue is low income, 
Red is modest income, yellow is high income. And these were the labels that people self-identified as, so they got to pick what they were. Uh, and what we saw, there was a great deal of commonality, and pretty much everybody wanted to see more grocery stores, more produce grocery stores, more Chinese grocery stores, more specialty food and butchers. Uh, everybody wanted to see more medical clinics and more pharmacies. People wanted to see more restaurants, more family-friendly restaurants and more budget restaurants. People wanted to see more bookstores and art supply and shared creative spaces. And that was really interesting to me because that was also, across the board, across the income spectrums, that art and creativity play a really prominent role and people want to see those kind of shared maker spaces and they want to see art supplies and bookstores and stuff like that, which was very positive to see. Um, and of course they want more things like family drop-ins, more seniors drop-ins, more post offices, full service drugstores and hardware stores. Basically people are looking, with the exception of the art component, people are looking for the same kind of uh, amenities that most communities take for granted on any given high street and uh, they'd like to see it more in the community. So what people definitely did not want to see more of were more check cashing operations and more medical marijuana uh, outlets. Uh, and I would point, there's a couple of weird little discrepancies um, that uh, there is sort of a disconnect when it comes to things like fast food. Like we did find that more people who identified as low income want to see more fast food, whereas people with higher incomes want to see less fast food. And I think that's an interesting conversation to expand upon that doesn't necessarily always get addressed. We often talk about you know, healthy city options and that kind of thing, but maybe the reality is, is that for low-income family, families, uh, fast food is better than the options that are currently available, so I think that's probably a larger discussion that I'm totally out of time. Unfortunately, this thing didn't make it into the chart. It had it in the, the report, but the final report will have it for anybody who's interested. Thanks, sorry. for the Carnegie Community Action Project, or CCAP, as many people know it. CCAP is a project of the board of the Carnegie Community Center Association. Uh, CCAP works in Engl with English, pardon me, and Chinese-speaking downtown east side residents in speaking out on their own behalf for changes that they'd like to see in the neighborhood. And they work on housing, income, and land use issues in the downtown east side of Vancouver so that the area can remain a low-income friendly neighborhood. Thanks. Thanks, Kiri, and thank you, Les, for the opening as well. Uh, so the focus of CCAP's retail research was on low-income residents, and we're talking about people on social assistance and people on welfare who only get $610 a month. And so one of the questions, our initial research questions, was about low-income retail. Is there such a thing as low-income retail, and where are these spaces? And so, um, the first step of this research was coming up with a survey and doing community consultation to see what was it we wanted to find out. And so some of the things we wanted to take into account in our survey were, um, obviously, was the price range in these shops. That's really important. There, there's a lot of different kinds of coffee shops and grocery shops. And so can you afford the average product in the shop? Is there anything you can afford at all? And we actually found that in a lot of shops, um, the people we were doing the survey with couldn't afford anything. Some places, the prices started at $3,000. Um, another important thing we wanted to take into account was sense of belonging. So, one of the questions was, do you feel judged or stigmatized in these places? Uh, you know, were you followed around by the shopkeeper? And also, were there other low-income people in the shop? Is this a place that low-income people visit regularly? Uh, another question was looking into basic needs. Does this sell? things that serve the basic needs of low-income residents and also low-income Chinese seniors. Um, and so this is also related to accessibility as well. And we also looked at those accessible for people in wheelchair and people with disabilities. Um, and we also did a map of looking, was there signage in Chinese or did staff speak Cantonese and Mandarin? And so those were some of the things we looked into with the survey. And we did the survey over the summer with low uh, the survey was all done by low-income downtown Eastside residents and Chinese seniors, and we surveyed about 450 shops in the downtown Eastside, and I'll show you the map in the area of what we found. Um, but one of the key findings that came out of our surveying and our research was that once we started doing the surveying, and one of the questions was, 
you know, would you visit this shop? Can you afford anything in this shop? And our conclusion, <laughs> what everyone said was, well, yeah, I would if I had money, but I don't. And so our conclusion was, although there are shops in the area, like Sunrise Market, and there's a lot of Chinese grocers and things like that that people really appreciate, and they do visit when they do have money, most of the time people have no money. On welfare, you get $610 a month. That leaves less than $18 a week for groceries, at best. And that means you really don't have a lot of money to spend on groceries or anything else. And most people rely on non-market food places, so that's free food places where you can get on the street, or places like Evelyn Cellar or the Carnegie. Um, and so that's kind of one of our key conclusions, that we need more places like that, that serve people that don't actually afford uh, market retail. And one of our key concerns as well is about gentrification and also the new gentrifying retail that's coming into the area. And we actually call them zones of exclusion. And we call them zones of exclusion because these are places where low-income people, they're often followed, they're surveilled, they're stigmatized, and they're discriminated against for being poor, for being drug users, for having mental health issues, uh, and or being racialized. So these are places where low-income people feel out of place and they feel alienated, and they will not visit these places. Um, and another factor to consider is that these places also, they push up the rents in the neighborhood and they contribute to the loss of low-income housing. And so you, I'm sure you all witnessed the transformation of the Woodward's area. But on that block now, uh, there's not a single shop anymore that's welcoming to low-income residents. And some of the places we went to, um, a juice bottle cost $10. <laughs> or you could get fake eyelashes for $210. And so these are not the kind of places that are welcoming or accessible to low-income residents. So that's one of our key concerns. How am I doing your timing? Okay. Uh, okay, this map really didn't turn out very well in this PowerPoint. I printed out some maps as well that you can see in the back. Um, so these are the 450 places we surveyed, and so we surveyed from Campbell Avenue over to Canby Street and, and the downtown east side Oppenheimer district and then Chinatown. And you really can't see on this map. But the red places are these kind of rent gentrifying retail and zones of exclusion. And so we found 156 of these places in the downtown east side, and we expect that it's gonna go up a lot in the coming years. Almost all the new retail that we found in the area, and like we found a lot that just opened in the last year, almost all of those places, I'd say like 99% of them maybe except the new 50 cent shop on Hastings Street, were places that did not serve the low-income community. And at the same time, we also lost a lot of shops. So for example, at 288 East Hastings, we lost about four or five places, and there's some shops that cater to the low-income Chinese community in specific. Um, we also found 86 vacant storefronts throughout the area, and those are the black dots. And don't even bother looking at this, but there's some maps at the back which I think are a bit clearer. Um, and some of our key concerns, there's a lot of, um, the city wants less vacant storefronts in the area, and that's understandable, and I think a lot of people in the community support that, but I think it's a big question for us, is what goes in there. And, and what we heard through our research and talking to people in the community is that people rather have a vacant storefront um, than having a high-end grocer where they can't access it. So for example, one of the new grocers in Chinatown, for example, is called Medina. Yeah. Delina? Delina. And so right at the entrance, they're standing a massive security guard so to enter the shop. Um, and so it's, it's really important what kind of shops go into these areas. And we also found that it's not enough if these places you know, hire a dishwasher from the community at the end of the day, these places still attract higher income people into the neighborhood, and they also don't serve low income residents. And, and so these are some of the things we want to take into account. And the key recommendations that we're coming out with in our report as well, and you can talk to me or Jean about the report, which will serve it. Um, how are people supposed to you know, benefit from a community economic development plan if they don't even have access to basic housing, they don't have access to a kitchen, you know, over 3,000 people don't have access to kitchens in the downtown east side. We live in SRO hotels. And also, with just 610 on welfare, you can't afford anything in shops. And so it's really important that, you know, everyone in the communities collaborates and puts uh, pressure on the government to push up the rates. That's all. Thank you for raising uh, the Raise the Rates initiative and campaign as well, which was uh,
with these things that you do strategy, and I know many businesses and sort of organizations in the community have also supported that campaign. Um, our next speaker is Wes Regan, with who is a sorry, Wes Regan is the city's community economic development planner. He's worked in the downtown east side since 2009 um, in CED and social enterprise development, and was previously the executive director for the Hastings. Crossings Business Improvement Area, or BIA. Wes is currently completing his master's thesis in urban studies at Simon Fraser University titled Density and Diversity Considering the Impacts of Mixed-Use Development on the Retail Culture of Vancouver's Main Street. Thanks, Wes. Thanks, Drew. Uh, and I want to thank Les again for the for the welcome here, everyone. And uh, yeah, I'm really uh, pleased to see so many people here. I think that uh, over the last couple of years, uh, concern around the retail health and uh, social inclusion in the downtown east side uh, has uh, really begun to get more exposure in media and it's and uh, in public discourse and it's uh, in large part because of the work that activists and advocates do in the downtown east side of course so uh, I, I, was, I thought I would be all clever and put animations and transitions in my slides and uh, I, I've obviously been clever to a fault because I have no control over the clicker here but uh, Amelia, I'm going to ask you, I'm just going to go like this. Do this. Do yeah. this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. So, is this a sign? First slide. So, so we've heard from a couple of different speakers here today uh, about this community-led research, which I'm really happy. Uh, I want to acknowledge that it's been done. I want to acknowledge that uh, funding support, this came from the Great Beginnings uh, Fund from uh, Wendy Yao, our uh, deputy city manager. Uh, and so uh, that's some leftover money from the Vancouver Agreement, frankly, uh, that we were able to tap into to, to pay to have this research done. I really, really want to thank you guys, all of you, for, for putting the time in and working with uh, local residents to, to get this done. I find it incredibly valuable. And just uh, that Kevin was able to come on later uh, as well with the research you were doing. It was just serendipitous that it was happening. So uh, thank you, all three of you, for, for that work and for your people. So the city is, is also, uh, at the same time, engaging in some research that came out of the community economic development strategy uh, process. So we're, one of the things that we're looking at, uh, and we're drafting up uh, some of these um, uh, research requests, uh, one of them is looking at the connection between the incentives and policy tools that we have at our disposal to engage in things like brownfield revitalization or industrial land revitalization or retail revitalization, which are allowable under the Vancouver Charter. The question we have right now is, okay, uh, as Maria said earlier, uh, you know, we want to see um, our storefront vacancy go down, but is there a way to revitalize the area or to incentivize these uh, sort of things that aligns with the needs that are outlined in the social impact assessment or that align with the goals that we have uh, in the um, city of reconciliation framework or that align with other goals in food policy or arts and culture strategy? How can we connect the economic piece to the, the social needs that we have in the community? So we're working on some of this research, which should hopefully the calls will be coming out in the next um, month or so for this piece. Next one. Another one I'm happy to say over the last few months, uh, my colleague Helen Ma, who is here uh, in the room somewhere with the downtown Eastside planning team, we work together uh, um, based on what we were hearing from the community from events that were at um, Center A last summer and uh, other events in the community. Um, we heard uh, references to the actions that other cities have been taking. So San Francisco, for example, has a legacy business program uh, that um, came out of Proposition J, one of the things they, they voted on uh, just about a year and a half ago now, I think it was. And there they identified uh, what they're calling legacy businesses, businesses that have been around in, in the case of San Francisco uh, for about um, 30 years or so, uh, 25 if they make um, a case. And it's based on uh, the the history, the role of that business is played in the community, stories that are associated with it, oftentimes these are family-owned businesses that sometimes go back generations. And they were doing this in response to uh, retail gentrification and the pressures uh, that they were experiencing there, uh, high-end stores and boutiques, chain stores moving in. Uh, and so we have uh, come up with a, a request for research support to help us with the question of how do we define a legacy business in, in the Vancouver context, in the neighborhoods here in the downtown east side adjacent. Uh, and once we do that, what is it that we can emulate given the, the legal framework that we have to work with, which is the Vancouver Charter? Um, how can we emulate the intent of that in a way that, that, that we can uh, faithfully follow up on given that? So next one, third piece, 
um, with another colleague uh, who works in the downtown division, we've been generally hearing, uh, not just in the downtown east side of Chinatown, but in other parts of the city, concerns about uh, the rapid rate of churn or retail turnover, some of the perceived pressures from uh, either speculation or development outright on the retail mix of areas. And so another piece of research that will be uh, undertaken this year is around just general trends and pressures uh, in uh, several other parts of the city. So we're trying to get a, a good understanding both from the combination of, of community-led research, working with consultants, and internally with our own teams in different departments, sharing um, what's going on, uh, trying to get better data about what's affecting these trends, and, uh, and be able to inform some policy responses, hopefully of some kind, um, this year would be great, I hope. And so next slide. So that's the research piece. There's also some planning responses that I'm going to touch on. Uh, and colleagues who are here today in the downtown East Side Planning team uh, have been working on this. But updated design guidelines for Hastings Kawasa. What we found sometimes hearing from uh, the business community is that some of the uh, design features of spaces have been difficult for them to work with. And they've had to put in some substantial tenant improvements or there's been issues around loading bays or awnings or whatever it might be. And so we've taken time to engage with the, with the community and engage with uh, consultants and businesses around and BIAs around the design guidelines of retail spaces themselves to try and make them more conducive to the business mix that we want to see. We've also got updated policy changes coming to protect light industrial. We understand that there's a lot of pressure, not, not just on the retail, but also on industrial lands. We want to protect these as, as employment lands. Uh, recognizing, of course, that the nature of work and, and businesses and technology has changed dramatically uh, over, over the past you know, few decades. So those are being updated right now. Next one. And so there will be uh, actually a, a public hearing January 26th if you're interested about what's, what's going on with the light industrial piece. Uh, February 4th, there's also an open house coming up here uh, about changes uh, being proposed uh, in Chinatown because of what we've been hearing from, from community. So we're going to be um, proposing a couple of different uh, potential responses here around introducing frontage limits on, uh, on the, the streets uh, and controlling the size of the development potential in the area. And so uh, we encourage you to come to the open house and hear more about that here with the downtown site planning staff uh, are proposing. Next. Next one also in that is also uh, looking at increasing the uh, amount of commercial space on the ground floor, so kicking up some of the retail uh, and have some office uh, on the mezzanine or ground floor retail, laneway retail. So just increasing the amount of the diversity of the types of spaces that, uh, that businesses can have access to in, in the community. And that includes for cultural uses and, and office. Uh, more immediately though, because we understand things are happening really, really fast and sometimes um, several months of feasibility studies and policy research and, and stuff like that obviously doesn't, um, a lot of work goes into it, but I know it sometimes feels that perhaps it, it's a, a slow moving response. We do have some stuff right now that's happening on the ground though, programmatically in response to this. So, so one of the recent things that came out of the, the community economic development strategy is uh, the Community Impact Real Estate Society, which is a new sort of arm's length nonprofit commercial real estate management uh, collaboration between BC Housing, who approached the city with this concept, uh, and I have to give kudos to them for that. Uh, they came to us and said, we're thinking about um, taking our commercial retail units in about almost 60 uh, spaces here in the city and putting those into a combined portfolio where we can do certain things with that uh, aggregated portfolio that otherwise we wouldn't be able to do on a one-on-one -on -one basis when we sign leases. Specifically to protect uh, low-income serving uh, retail assets, services, uh, and arts and culture spaces that are in a lot of the um, publicly owned buildings. And so right now, the call's gone out to hire an executive director for this uh, organization. The City of Vancouver, BC Housing, and Van City Community Foundation are uh, the three founding directors of it, but the next step for us is ensuring that the community uh, has a role in the governance of this organization and informing the priorities of it uh, as we go uh, into a tenant recruitment phase and an ongoing management. And so this kind of research that's being done is, is crucially important for helping to guide uh, the decision making of that board and staff. 
And on that note, too, I just want to say, echoing what Maria said earlier, if you care about small businesses in, in the downtown east side or just in Vancouver in general, I encourage you to write your MLA or MP uh, and ask them to, uh, to keep advocating hard to increase welfare rates because uh, that money is spent locally supporting these businesses. And as Maria points out, if low-income residents just don't have that money, they're unable to support the businesses that otherwise they, they would like to. So I encourage you to, to make that connection. Uh, I'm happy to note here that Gabriel Yu is here from, uh, from Jenny Kwan's office. So it's good to see you here, Gabriel. I hope that you'll take this back to Jenny. On that note, Amy Robinson from LOCO here as well. I know you've been doing some research with downtown Vancouver, BI, and others. LOCO BC has been showing a lot of leadership over the last few years in the retail gentrification area. So if you're interested in this and concerned about these things, write your MLA, your MP, and then go check out what local BC does do. Okay, next. So I've gone through this essentially. So the next, some next steps here. Okay, I'm almost done. Some next steps here are um, regarding the city and even Vance City Community Foundation are, um, you know, how do we move this partnership forward? Because it could potentially be uh, a really effective tool in in mitigating some of the retail displacement and gentrification that we're seeing a way of sort of democratizing uh, community development when it comes to at least the retail component of, of some of these buildings. Uh, and so uh, we're also further exploring uh, whether there's opportunities to include uh, privately owned retail spaces and possibly even some of the city owned spaces. Um, so we're gonna be looking at, you know, how do we uh, engage in this relationship moving forward? What are the potential to explore those different things? Uh, and uh, so hopefully later this year, you know, you'll be hearing more about the work that Sirius is doing. We also have been engaging with small businesses. Uh, another quick start project that came out of the CED strategy is strengthening the employment continuum through small business. I think Joji Kumagai is here somewhere in the room. Strathcona BIA and Gastown BIA and uh, Hastings Crossing BIA um, um, came, came together with a proposal for uh, working with small business owners. Because as Pete pointed out, a lot of them are very interested in learning how they can give back to the community, be engaged, hire people that have barriers. And so that's another project engaging small business owners that we're really happy to see moving ahead. Next one. Next one. And then we do have a couple of uh, large institutional partners that we've been engaging. Uh, we're are going to be working with us to uh, uh, engage the small business owners further around social impact employment and the types of impacts, broadly speaking, they have in the community. So programmatically, we're doing a handful of things right now as we go, uh, and moving at a little bit of a slower pace, but still putting you know putting some significant effort in getting these things done are these RFPs uh, requests for proposals for the research support to help us build on the work that the community's done with their research and to help us answer some big questions we have about the type of appropriate responses we can take as local government so with that thank you very much and uh, look forward to the panel